Dr. Jack Bright is a man known by many names. And whether that name is Oh God No or just Jack, if you've spent any amount of time here on SCP Explained, you've surely at least heard of the good doctor once or twice. He's a high-ranking senior staff member at Psych-19, one of the Foundation's most notable facilities, and has served as a director and important member of the Foundation's upper ranks for decades. Of course, you wouldn't be able to tell that by looking at him, because depending on the current circumstances, Dr. Bright might not look a day over 13, or 80, or 90, or he might just be a chimpanzee. This is because Dr. Bright, in his younger days, came into contact with SCP-963, a metal amulet that gives its wearer's consciousness immortality. When the amulet is moved from one body to another, Dr. Bright's consciousness moves with it, allowing him to occupy a variety of bodies. From animals to old ladies, Dr. Bright has been them all. Heck, Bright's body-swapping abilities have even proven themselves to be incredibly useful for the Foundation, so the guy's able to get some actual work done when he's not goofing off. In undercover operations, Dr. Bright has been used to infiltrate areas that the Foundation would typically have trouble reaching, or when clandestine operations are the best course of action. In the 2000 United States election, Dr. Bright briefly occupied the body of George Bush in order for the Foundation to investigate political opponent Al Gore's activities without suspicion. But that mess is a story for another day. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a different side of Dr. Jack Bright, one that isn't so overt, one that's lurking behind the joking facade and silly antics so commonly associated with Bright's identity. This is SCP Explained, and we'd like to welcome you into the complicated, dramatic, and ultimately tragic world of the Bright family, specifically the story of SCP-590. Your consciousness being immortal certainly has its perks. For one, you can't die. On the other hand, you can't die. We all know the old cliché about immortality, how your friends and loved ones will grow old and die off while you'll stay the same age. How centuries will start to feel like months. How your mind will eventually crumble under the weight of countless years and experiences, because no man was made to live this long. But while it is cliché for us, it's reality for Dr. Bright. He's painfully aware of how futile his situation is, and behind closed doors, it scares him. Dr. Bright struggles intensely with existential depression, and for good reason, too. Right now, he might be fine, but in the relatively near future, he'll start experiencing that cycle of death and rebirth of those around him and himself. And over time, that cycle will just keep repeating. Body after body, friend after friend, tragedy after tragedy. In the long term, Dr. Bright knows that his life cannot have a happy ending. It's most likely because of this biting, inevitable future that Bright makes the most of his time with those around him in the Foundation, making himself known as a charming, goofy personality, brimming with quirks and zaniness. The part of Bright that makes others laugh does so because deep down, Bright needs something to take his mind off his situation. He wants the same type of familiarity and comfort that he brings to other people. But Bright's public-facing persona is often torn to shreds in private. On top of being an undying soul, Bright has to contend with an even more stressful experience, his family. The Bright family is a colorful assortment of old blood that has run the inner circle of the anomalous world for generations. There are members of the Bright family that were there when the first administrator signed the policy that created the SCP Foundation, members who serve time on the Overseer Council, and even those who operate outside of the parameters of the Foundation. Dr. Bright is just one among many other individuals of major anomalous significance in his bloodline and it's only fitting that every family has its issues. For the Brights, all strong personalities who hold positions of power in various places across the anomalous world, unity isn't exactly a strong point. In fact, most of the family isn't anywhere near each other, each member existing in their own bubble, working towards their own individual goals that often do not align with the rest of their kin. But there are occasions when the Bright family all come together to sneer at one another from across the table and enjoy a nice, loving reunion. 
though these meetings are often called out of necessity and are far and few between. This gathering of anomalous individuals is deemed important enough by the Foundation to have its own designated security term, nicknamed Code Brown. When a Code Brown is issued, it can only mean that the Brights are locked away in a room, convening, arguing, and scheming over something of great importance to them, and the rest of the world should stay out of their family business. And when Jack Bright got his latest call for a family meeting from one of the family members he was on speaking terms with, he could only think of just how bad of an idea that was. It had been quite some time since Bright saw the rest of his family, and he didn't particularly look forward to when they would meet again. In the time since then, Bright had been taking care of TJ, his younger brother, whose story is nearly as tragic as Jack's. Don't worry, we'll get back to the events of the family reunion soon enough. For now, let's have a look at TJ Bright. TJ was a product of the cruel, brutal attitude the early Foundation took out on the objects it contained. Needlessly cold containment procedures that denied basic needs for human anomalies, pointless tests that often resulted in death or worse, and a general lack of regard for decency or ethics. This archaic era would come to an end upon the formation of the Ethics Committee, a board formed in the upper ranks of the Foundation that would enforce a better treatment of the objects contained by the organization, with severe consequences for those that disobeyed the new, more human doctrine. But in the case of T.J. Bright, there was nothing the committee could do. T.J., who had been given the designation of SCP-590 long ago, was an ordinary person who happened to have anomalous abilities like countless others that the Foundation had dealt with before. He appeared to be permanently 16 years old, never aging or changing in appearance once during his time in containment. The abilities in question that had caught the attention of the Foundation were TJ's inherent power to cure illness. Physical, mental, injuries, and wounds, TJ could cure them all with just a touch of his hand, but at an unfortunate cost. Whatever injury TJ would cure, it would be mirrored onto his own body. A giant gaping wound could be healed by TJ, but the after effects of such, such as scar tissue and any lasting side effects, would later appear on his own body, leaving the boy to feel the pain of everyone he touched and healed. The early Foundation needlessly exploited the SCP-590's abilities in tests and procedures, testing the limits of TJ's body and its abilities. This, of course, was carried out without the knowledge of his brother, Dr. Bright, who at the time did not have enough pull or power within the organization to save his brother. He could only watch and hope that one day, SCP-590 could live a better life outside of his cell, as T.J. Bright, and not a number on a placard to be experimented with so casually. The Foundation's experiments with TJ sometimes involved the use of SCP-500, an all-curing panacea that would fully heal SCP-590 and bring him back to full health, a state that would later be reverted when the Foundation started their experiments with the boy once again. TJ had endured immeasurable pain, and as a result had suffered a broken mental state over the years. As time went by and things within the Foundation had started to change, including Jack Bright's prominence, he worked as hard as he could to push through bureaucratic red tape and work out a solution that would leave TJ in a less torturous position. And when the time came, it was Jack Bright who made the call to have SCP-590 cure a variety of specific mental conditions that would leave the boy in a dulled state, unable to fully comprehend the pain he endures should the Foundation ever have to utilize TJ's abilities again. Bright's decision to do this to his brother was questionable, and a part of the doctor regrets it to this day. But at the time, it seemed like a more preferable option than having SCP-590 be fully aware of what was happening to him. Unfortunately, the idea that TJ's reduced mental capacities would prevent him from understanding what was occurring to him was a misunderstanding, and TJ was still more than capable of perceiving what was happening to him. And that was pain. He knew he was being hurt, he knew he wasn't loved, and even though his mind was unlike Bright's or those who experimented with him, he felt the same things they did. By the time of the reunion, TJ was fully in the care of Dr. Bright. Eventually, the modern foundation worked out that it was doing the poor boy more harm than good to keep him locked up in a cell all day. And Bright, who was now one of the most notable and important individuals in the foundation, 
was able to pull enough strings to get TJ out of confinement. Now he could truly rest without worry that he would be exploited and abused, safe alongside his older brother. Inside the meeting room, all of the famous figures of the Bright family, well, the ones that were alive at least, were there. Dr. Bright sat alongside TJ, who occupied himself with a coloring book and a set of crayons. From across the table was Mikhail Bright, better known as Overseer 05-6, a former Foundation agent who operated under the name of Cowboy. 05-6 was a hardened individual, with a heavy interest in firearms and a whole lot of luck on his side. Mikhail and Jack, almost at the same time, both fired out remarks about how bad of an idea they felt this reunion was. The one who called the reunion was their elder sister, Claire Bright, whose aged body felt notably out of place among the collection of forever young Brights. Whether it was Jack's body hopping, TJ's longevity, or Mikhail's use of SCP-006, the Overseer Council's fountain of youth to keep himself young for an extended period of time. Also present was Yorick Elroy, Jack Bright's grandson. As the three of them discussed the state of Claire Bright's apparent aging situation, Yorick remarked that he thought she was involved with that incident at Site-23. This, Dr. Bright knew, was referring to an incident he'd rather forget, where a reality bender contained by the Foundation attempted to give the Bright family, himself, Mikhail, and TJ included, a happy ending where they would be cured of their ailments and allowed to live ordinary lives. Of course, this was just the product of a reality bend, and the fantasy quickly fell apart when the Brights realized what was going on. Jack rather not dwelt on what could have been. Across from York was Foundation agent Sarah Argent, one of the youngest members of the Bright family, who worked as an Overseer Council's Hand Sinister a special title granted to an assassin used by the Council to sort out messy business for them. The previous Hand Sinister was none other than Mikhail Bright, whose pearl revolvers that came with the position now belonged to Sarah. Mikhail was growing impatient and asking how long it would take for the rest of the family to show up, the rest of the family being the Brights that weren't involved in the Foundation, the powerful individuals who had worked their way into various groups of interest and aspects of the anomalous world. While some directly opposed the Foundation and its mission and others were neutral, they were all Brights, which meant their presence was necessary. While the two sides sometimes worked together, there was always an air of bad blood and poor trust between them. Dr. Bright, in particular, was not looking forward to the rest of this meeting. The first to arrive was an individual named Nobody, who the Foundation had a difficult time keeping up with. Nobody was a title granted from one person to the next, who each worked towards a greater plan that only nobody knew the specific details of, leaving the Foundation completely unaware of the group's larger interests. Nobody's voice was impossible to source, and her appearance was even harder to pin down, but she was there. Nobody circled around the table, remarking that the other side of the family had sent her first to make sure the Foundation Brights were all abiding by the rules. At one point in time, Nobody did have another name, but in becoming the next Nobody, she left her previous life behind. The next to arrive was Claire Lumineau II, a human with electromagnetic abilities whose motives were largely unknown. When she pulled back the chair to sit down, sparks flew in the air, briefly startling the rest of the room. After that came David Blindman, a gruff, sunglass-wearing member of the Serpent's Hand, a group of anomalous individuals who worked to free anomalies from the confinements of the Foundation, who they call Jailers. Blindman was Mikkel's son, and possessed the anomalous ability to see into the future. He was the unofficial representative of the Unnumbered Brood, a subsection of the Bright family consisting of Mikkel's illegitimate children from his wilder days as a free-roaming Foundation agent and a constant reminder to the overseer of his past. Naturally, Mikkel was less than pleased to see his son arrive. And then there was Evelyn Navon, who levitated into the room wearing a traditional hijab and dress. Evelyn was one of the original 13 founding members of the SCP Foundation and matriarch of most of the Bright family. Unfortunately, Evelyn was kicked off the council for reasons unknown. But rumor has it that it had something to do with her terrible experiments as a genius geneticist, creating monsters by splicing the DNA of the ordinary and the anomalous. She sold her work to groups of interest such as Dr. Wondertainment or Prometheus Labs, 
who benefited from having such fine test subjects to work with. Her current activities are largely unknown, but as the rest of the family knew, they couldn't be anything good. The final member of the Bright family to enter was the only one who was trusted by all of them and was a man of many, many names, who was most commonly referred to as Tamlin. Tamlin was a mysterious individual who existed for centuries, far longer than any other member of the family. He had something to do with time, but no one was quite sure of what it was that he did, but they all knew that he was important and that he was the only one who attempted to keep peace and balance between the various factions of the family. Tamlin took a mental count of the room, realizing that everyone was present and addressed them all, ready to explain why they were there. Collectively, the family came to realize that the one who called the meeting, Claire Bright, was not there. Tamlin slowly explained that she had passed away, and he had called the family together in her steed to present a videotape containing her dying wish. The tape was concocted through Claire and Tamlin's time shenanigans, and featured a recording of Claire who, through Tamlin's abilities to travel through and control time, was able to respond and interact with the members of the family in the room. As morbid as Dr. Bright felt this was, he would make sure to treasure this final interaction with his sister. Claire's recording contained her will, and with Tamlin's help, she distributed gifts to the other members of the family, final remembrances she had collected from across the anomalous world for them to cherish. An egg with a universe inside of it for Evelyn, the literal sword of Damocles to hang over Mikkel's head, Jack Bright's first ever bottle of whiskey that he made so many years before, documents she entrusted to her daughter, Claire II. When it came time for TJ's gift, however, the boy suddenly grew serious and declined it. The recording of Claire understood and stated that if he didn't want it, then she would instead have Tamlin give it to someone who needed it. Dr. Bright could only wonder what it was that she had planned to give TJ, but it seemed like the boy's selfless nature had won again, and he was unable to accept it. After the gifts had been distributed, the tape cut out. Tamlin stated that this was all that Claire had recorded, and that she wanted her death to bring the family together once again, to remind them all that they were family. Claire's sincerity had brought the room to silence, each member of the family engaged in deep thought. As Tamlin gave parting remarks, one by one, each member left. Mikhail was embarrassed by the ordeal, immediately trying to revert back to his overseer mindset, but he couldn't. Claire's loss was already affecting him. In the end, there was only Tamlin, who left a single blue rose on top of the VCR player that contained Claire's recording in remembrance of someone he felt almost understood him. As Dr. Bright left the meeting, he still felt conflicted about his family, but at the very least, he felt there was progress being made. After all, they had all been in the same room for more than 10 minutes without trying to kill one another. He glanced at the boy at his side, wondering if he made the right decision all those years ago. While that much and most of his job with the Foundation was uncertain, he knew one thing for a fact. He had to protect TJ. Now go check out SCP Immortal Dr. Bright Explained and SCP-963 What Would You Do If You Were Immortal Like Dr. Jack Bright for more of the wacky world of Jack Bright.